Hello everyone and welcome back to Atman Unlimited. I want to make one more video on the nitty gritty of end mills and in this video I want to specifically cover face mills and some in insert geometry uh, for face mills and, and just cover some of the basics. Uh, but before we do that I wanted to address a comment that a viewer had on our last video about the 1.5 uh, cutters of engagement rule of thumb. So I talked to some other people in depth about this to get more clarification and the consensus is yeah it's a rule of thumb it's something to strive for you may not be able to achieve it or you may not be able to achieve it in all cases. Now also keep in mind that this rule of thumb is coming from people that are operating very large machines that are very rigid they're using, you know, Cat 50 or large HSK tool holders. They're running, you know, 30, 40, 50 horsepower spindles. They're using shrink fit tooling. Okay? So, it's a different realm than what we're talking about in a home shop. Okay? But I, I did do some numbers for you. So, the specific question that was asked, I had to write this down because I can't remember these many numbers. Uh, the specific question was, I have a three flute, 30 degree end mill. And the diameter really doesn't matter as long as you keep it scaled in diameters. And if you have a three flute 30 degree end mill and you want to keep one and a half of the cutting uh, teeth engaged, you need to have a hundred percent step over at two times the diameter. Now that is a really aggressive cut. Now if you want to limit yourself to a half a diameter step over, which is kind of our rule of thumb, a lot of people don't like to go over a half a diameter of, of step over, you would need three times the diameter of depth of cut. Again, that's pretty aggressive. Okay? Now that's with a 30 degree three flute end mill. If you changed your mill to a four flute 50 degree end mill, now to keep a one and a half tooth engagement, you would need at a half a diameter step over, you would only need one diameter depth of cut. So that's a lot closer to the realm of, you know, what people are kind of used to. But, but here's the main takeaway. The one and a half teeth is like perfect optimal, you know, bliss it's not going to be achieved very often. But we want to think about it, and this is good because we have people thinking about it, and we want to avoid the absolute worst circumstance. And that is where we have complete cutting tooth or the cutting edge disengagement, and we have a period of time where we're not cutting any material, and then we have re-engagement. Remember, that's the worst case scenario because that's going to generate more of a square wave type profile. Now, for that same cutter, uh, a three flute, 30 degree cutter, to always keep at least one edge engaged at somewhere in its cut, you would only need a half a diameter step over and a half a diameter depth of cut with that specific um, flute of end mill, and then you would always have at least one tooth somewhere in the cut, so you're not going to zero every time you know, a tooth exits a cut and enters a cut. Okay? So, but you can see by going from a three flute 30 degree to a four flute 50 degree, it completely changes the, you know, profile of cut that you can do to achieve the one and a half, you know, rule of thumb. Okay, but, but again, it's just that. It's just a rule of thumb. Get yourself thinking about your cutter engagement and your width of cut and your depth of cut. Okay, so that's that's the answer I got. I don't know if it's a good one or not, but that's what I got. Okay, so uh, moving on, we're going to talk about face mills, and I'm just going to touch on the very brief surface topics of face mills. Keep in mind, with a face mill and insert geometry. All of the same things that we already discussed still apply, okay? So we're still going to have our rake angles, we're still going to have our relief angles, you know, all that still applies with the cutter geometry. 
One thing that is missing in milling insert geometry is chip breakers. Typically you're not going to see talk about chip breakers in the inserts at all because milling by its nature is an interrupted cut. So every time you finish one swipe of the cut, whatever your width of cut is, you're going to completely exit that cut and the chip's going to break. So you don't need a specific geometry to try to break the chip like we do in lathe because lathe you can make a continuous spiral for as long as your material is. Okay, so you can end up with this huge string. Very important to cut your, your break your chips in a lathe. So that's the one thing that's missing out of milling insert geometry. So let's go down uh, into the office again on the bench and I'll, I'll pull out two face mills and a couple of different inserts and we'll talk about some of the geometries and how they affect um, your cutting recipes. Here we have two different types of face mills and two completely different ends of the spectrum of size. So this guy here is a 3 inch 45 degree face mill and this guy here is a 4 insert 90 degree face mill. And then I've got inserts uh, that I use various inserts. So this insert is for this guy. This insert is a Seco insert. This is for the 2 inch facer that you see. I probably use this face mill the most. And then this insert is for a inch and a half uh, face mill. So these inserts are this insert here is specifically geared towards aluminum. It has a pretty high positive rake to it. Um, this is a more general common insert. It still has a positive rake, but it's not as severe. Uh, same thing with this one. This is a general insert. So I try to buy a lot of general use inserts and less specific inserts just because, you know, the job shop nature, you know, one call could be for aluminum, the next call could be for steel. You know, you don't know. So I, I kind of just try to find an insert that works well with either uh, but it's not particularly spectacular for any. Now the geometries here are quite different. So we've got a 45 degree geometry and a 90 degree geometry. And this was the major thing that I wanted to touch on uh, with face mills because a lot of people miss this concept. And so these 90 degree face mills are nice because you can come right up to a vertical wall and get really really close and accurate with them uh, without you know sacrificing that vertical wall. These ones on the other hand you can't get anywhere near a vertical wall because of the 45 degree angle. However with these guys you can feed them um, almost twice as fast, not quite twice as fast, it's like a, oh, 70 percent. Okay and here's why. So let's, I drew up another little nifty uh, diagram here. And I've got my pointer. So here is a cut recipe that has a chip load and then a depth of cut. I just threw some numbers in here just so that you kind of got the math. So I, I said, okay, I'm going to take a 5 thou per tooth chip load. So there's my chip load every time I cut. And then I'm just going to go 10 thou deep. So twice as deep as my chip load. So this would be with your 90 degree cutter. So every time you take out this chunk of metal. Now, we say with this 45 degree cutter we can feed almost twice as fast. Well, why is that? Well, you have to remember that the cutting edge goes this way right here. And your chip load is this distance right here, not necessarily this distance. Okay, So your chip thickness is on an angle as well, parallel to your cutter angle. So even though we're still going to feed this guy 5 thou, we're going to take the same feed rate and the same RPM. Notice that the chip thickness from the cutting edge to the next cutting edge is only 3 and a half thou. So we almost got a, a 50% reduction in our chip load just by changing the insert geometry. So if I wanted to maintain that same chip load, now I have to go, you know, I think it's like 60 or 70% faster on my feed rate, you know, to maintain a 5,000 chip load. 
So it's like, oh wow, that's really cool, Tim. You mean just by going from this type of insert to this type of insert, I can double my feed rate. Yeah, almost. But there's no free lunch. And the reason for that is even though that, you know, this chip load is less here and the same, you know, versus this one, these cuts are still going to use approximately the same horsepower. So if you increase your feed rate to get this chip load back up to 5 thou, you are going to use substantially more horsepower. Okay? Because your your material removal rate is going to be higher over here. Now why is that? Well, just because this chip is thinner right now, if we have the same feed rates, look at the depth of cut so depth of cut over here is 10 thou with a 5 thou chip load. However, here we've got a 3.5 thou chip load, but our equivalent depth of cut, the length of that chip, is going to be a lot higher. Okay, it's 14 thou. So even though the chip is thinner, it's effectively increasing your depth of cut. So if you increase your feed rate to get this back up to 5 thou, keep in mind that your depth of cut is higher than 10 thou. So when you do your calculations, you have to consider your chip thickness and your effective depth of cut when you're you know, calculating, all, calculating all this out. Now the, the nice thing is, is that uh, HSM calculator and G-Wizard and all the major tool calculators, they'll ask you when you do a face mill calculation what your lead angle is on your cutter. And you can tell it 45 or 90. And a similar geometry happens when you're using uh, a round insert, you get trochoidal um, milling and it's it's same thing except the chip's going to start real thin out towards the bottom and then get thicker at the top. Similar type of thing but the geometry's a little different. So that's why they make 90 degree cutters and 45 degree cutters. Now the next major thing that I want to discuss with this is they have insert based tooling that will have adjustable depths for the inserts. So there's an adjustment on this. This is not one of them. This is just a, you know, screw the insert in and what you get is what you get. Now the downside to insert tooling is all of these inserts have a tolerance associated with them. So when you screw them into these pockets, each one of these cutting faces isn't necessarily going to be exactly at the same depth. And same thing with this one. So if these aren't all exactly at the same depth, your surface finish may suffer. So there's two ways to combat that. One way is that they make these adjustable. My personal opinion is the adjustable ones are a total PETA, okay? They're very time consuming to adjust and you never get them perfect. The other way to combat this is called a wiper insert. And unfortunately I don't have any of them on hand, but I will very easily describe what a wiper insert is. So if we ordered a wiper insert that matched this insert geometry, what you would see is this bottom edge would be extended out and then it would come up. So the bottom of the wiper insert is a lot broader. The other thing is if you had accurate enough measuring equipment, you would find that the cutting edge of a wiper insert protrudes down anywhere from five ten thousandths to a thousandths of an inch lower than the standard insert would. And the reason for that is you want that one wiper insert to be the final say on your depth of cut. So these guys will do the, the majority of horsing the material out, you know, and the leading edge of that wiper insert will do its fair share of getting its chip load out. But then afterwards, it's going to have this cutting edge down here that's a little bit lower than everybody else to clean up your cut and give you a really great surface finish. Now again, there's no free lunch. There's a downside to wiper inserts. They typically wear faster. So wiper inserts, you're going to have to replace more often. And also, depending on what type of cutter geometry you're using, 
the wiper insert may only have one edge on it. Okay, so the nice thing about these uh, square uh, inserts that are 45 is these have four cutting faces on them. And that is pretty critical when you consider each one of these inserts is about 10 bucks a shot. So there's $60 worth of inserts in this guy. There's $40 worth of inserts on this guy. So if you use these, you basically cut your tooling costs in half because you get four cutting faces versus using these, which cost the same amount of money, but you only get two cutting faces because they're rectangular. Same thing with this guy. This guy only has two cutting faces, where this guy has four. Okay, so those are the, the big takeaways, you know, with, with facing mills. You know, you got your two different types of geometry. You know, this guy you can feed faster, but you can't come up against, you know, vertical walls. This guy you can come up against vertical walls, but he's going to take a full chip uh, every rotation. You can use wiper inserts or get adjustables because none of these cutting faces are going to be exactly equal. Remember when you have a standard mill, it's all ground in the same machine so that all the tips of that end mill are going to be exactly identical because they're all made at the same time. These aren't made exactly at the same time. Okay, So those are pretty much the takeaways to think about when you're looking at um, you know, milling inserts. I hope you enjoyed our little overview of insert based face mills and the different geometries and you know some of the things to think about. Uh, one of the other things to think about when you're actually going to purchase some of this tooling is that the insert pockets on some of the manufacturer's tooling is proprietary. So you may have to buy that manufacturer's inserts if you buy that manufacturer's tool. Okay, and some of this tooling can be pretty expensive. Some of the higher end face mills, you know, you get up into the thousand dollars, you know, for one face mill. You can get some, you know, entry level import stuff for a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. You know, quality and longevity is, is the question that you have to answer for yourself of, you know, how much money you want to spend on that spectrum. So I enjoyed making this series. It was received uh, pretty well. There was a lot of good comments and good conversation um, going on. It is a very complex topic. These videos are in no way, you know, all encompassing of this topic. You know, we could go on and make video after video after video. Just the sheer volume of tooling manufacturers and tooling geometries out there, you know, got to tell you something. So uh, thanks for watching. If you have any other comments or you would like to see, you know, a subject in more detail, you know, please let me know and we'll see if we can make a video for you. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.